True Crime Files podcast is kind of different from the other true crime podcasts because I'm going to be presenting the facts to you of cases that I worked on, that I know about, and then we're going to examine uh, what did the detectives do? How did they solve the case? How did they track down the suspect? And then we're going to look at the jury trial and we're going to go behind the scenes, you know, what happened in the courtroom as well as maybe in chambers and in the preparation of the case and with between the attorneys. Then finally we're going to talk about the conclusion of the case as well as where are the parties today that were involved in it? Uh, what are they doing? And before we get started, I just want to mention uh, I would appreciate if you'd click the subscribe button. Uh, I've got 87 different presentations that I have ready to put together if there's an interest. If you're interested in it, uh, I'll do it. Uh, generally, I try to come out with a new uh, podcast Friday at 3 o'clock. So uh, if you subscribe, you'll know for certain uh, when the next one is up. All right, let's talk about the facts of the case today. Let's get started. Today we're going to be examining a case that involves Hollywood, movie stars, the celebrity life. And I know many of you like to be celebrities and live that good life. However, after watching this video, you might change your mind. So why don't we get started and see what it's all about to live a celebrity life. Today's talk is murder in Brando's house, the Christian Brando case. Well, what's that all about? Well, let's go to the date of May 16th, 1990, in Marlon Brando's house up uh, on Mulholland Drive in the Hollywood Hills. And Cheyenne Brando was there, and her stepbrother, Christian Brando, as well. Her fiancé, uh, Dag Drillet, had just flown in uh, earlier in the day. So those were the people in the house at the time. And at evening time, oh, I don't know whether it was 6 o'clock, uh, Cheyenne said, hey, I'm hungry. And she said, okay, let's go out for dinner. And Drag, Dag was tired, so he didn't want to go. But Kristen said, I'll take you. So they went to Musso and Frank uh, restaurant uh, on Hollywood Boulevard, an old famous restaurant. And they ate, and they're at the table way at the far end there next to the wall. And they had a nice meal, and they had a number of drinks, and Kristen may have had a few more drinks than he should have. So they talked, and they talked, and Cheyenne started talking about how, you know, her fiancé, Dag, had abused her. And, you know, Kristen's listening to all of that, and it's kind of upsetting him. Now, this went on for maybe an hour or so, and then they decided to leave to go back, and... Kristen says, oh, let me go by our, my apartment, and he does, and he picks up his 45 automatic. So now he returns to Marlon Brando's house, uh, and most likely is uh, oh, 10.30, maybe even 11, uh, and Cheyenne is tired. You know, she's pregnant, about seven months pregnant, so she says, no, I want to go to bed. Uh, so she goes to her bedroom. And Christian then walks into the family room where Dag was on the sofa. He is sitting on the sofa there. Then all of a sudden, there's a shot. There's a shot. And Dag is shot on that sofa right there. And, you know, that the noise of the gunfire, uh, you know, got the attention of Marlon Brando. And he came rushing in, and Christian says, I killed Dag. He's dead, Pop. I didn't mean to do it. He went for the gun and it went off. Well, Marlon, hearing that and seeing uh, Dag lying there, blood on his face, uh, he tells somebody to call the police and the police come out. It's a long ways for the police to reach the place on the top of the hill on Mulholland Drive. So it wasn't until maybe 11 or 11.05 that the police arrived at the gate at the bottom, right off Mulholland Drive, and they wait there, and it's eventually opened, and they're able to get in. It takes them a while to get all the way around uh, to the front of the house, and when they got there, the officer saw 
Marlon Brando is out there standing, and Christian Brando is next to his sister, and Cheyenne is just crying, crying, and uh, Christian is trying to console her. So that is what it looks like when the officers arrive, and when they went inside, they could see that uh, Dag, uh, the victim, had been shot, shot in the face. So the officers then call for the detectives to come out because uh, it was pretty certain that he was dead. So they observe, and what was interesting about it is that in Dag's hands are several items. One is a TV controller in the right hand, and the other is um, a cigarette roller and a lighter. So those are the things that are in his hands as he's lying on that sofa with the gunshot wound to his head. Now, when the detectives get there, they start looking for the gun and they do find the gun um, on the floor. And then they find a shell casing uh, that had been ejected from the automatic. Now, they wanted to check it out. So the CSI team came in to see you know, the trajectory of that uh, shot. And they have to tear up the carpet, so they take a knife, cut it up, and when they dig down there, they find the slug, the bullet, uh, that had gone through uh, Dag's head and had exited into the wooden floor. Now, at that point, Christian is arrested, and he's taken down to uh, Hollywood uh, Station, to be interviewed and to be processed. So what was interesting was that Marling had gotten on the phone. He had called William Kunstler. Now remember, this must be almost midnight or almost one o'clock. He's able to reach William Kunstler, the most famous attorney in the United States uh, at that time. And he said, uh, you know, would you, would you represent my son, Christian? He's been arrested for murder. And the counselor said, yeah, yeah, I'd be more than happy to help you out, Marlon. So he got involved in the case. Uh, however, he didn't really know California law and he didn't understand criminal procedure. So Bob Shapiro was brought in to represent Christian uh, in all the matters once the uh, arraignment occurred. Now, the preliminary hearing occurred oh, within, a, within the month in the criminal courts building and the evidence was presented and it was the police officers who testified what they saw when they came in that the victim had been shot in the head, was lying on the sofa and there was a gun there and that uh, Christian Brando was there. So he's held to answer for trial on the charges and bail was set at uh, ten million dollars, and you know even Marlon couldn't raise that type of money. So Christian stays in the uh, county jail, and then eventually they have another hearing, and the bail is reduced to two million dollars. And Marlon was able to take the, his house, put it up as collateral, and Christian walks out of the county jail with his father and his stepbrother. Now the prosecution uh, was working on the case and they were interested in Cheyenne's statements. She had made some interesting statements and her statements were, one was, the gunshot was no accident, it was murder. And she goes on implicating her father uh, being involved in the, the shooting. So the prosecutors you know, need her to testify when it comes up for trial. So what happened was, you know, uh, Marlon said, oh yeah, Cheyenne would remain in the United States until the trial was over. However, she was on a flight back to Tahiti within a very short period of time. Once she had gotten to Tahiti, uh, and since she was a citizen of Tahiti, um, they wouldn't uh, allow her to be sent back to uh, testify at the trial. Uh, this made it very 
difficult for the DA's office because her statements were so incriminating of her of uh, Kristen as well as her father. So now they can't get her, so the DA is not going to be able to use her statements at the trial. That's the difficulty they're having. But there's another difficulty that is even uh, more of a problem, and that is that Christian, when he went down to the uh, police station, he was interviewed by the police, and he made a number of incriminating statements, but they were inconsistent. And the prosecution wanted to have the jury see how he had one story after another story, and they were all different. So this was going to be uh, very important uh, evidence presented by uh, the DA. However, the problem was when the detectives uh, Mirandized him, they advised him of his Miranda rights, and when they got to right number four, they just skipped over that because it says, if you cannot afford to hire a lawyer, one will be appointed to represent you before any questioning if you wish. Well, the detectives knew that, you know, he was one of the uh, wealthiest families in uh, Hollywood. So there's no problem that he's going to be able to afford a lawyer. So they didn't read that to him, just out of respect. Well, that was a big mistake because the court ruled that the DA could not use his inconsistent statements of what happened as far as the uh, shooting. So two big items were out for the prosecution. But the defense also had some problems. They had problems with their case in that, as I said to you earlier, Dag had in his hand uh, a TV controller and then uh, cigarette paper and lighter. There was no way that he had a gun in his hand. He did not have a weapon uh, in attacking uh, uh, Christian. So that was a problem they had. There was another problem, which was as who was the aggressor. You know, they wanted to say that, uh, you know, Dag had gotten up and had aggressively attacked Christian. Well, if you look at it, you can see that doesn't add up because the trajectory of the shot is that he's lying down. He's lying down on the sofa. He is not an aggressor. So the defense has got some very substantial problems with their case. So the case is continued and continued and eventually both sides agree that, okay, okay, let's see if we can work something out because each one knew they weren't gonna be able to uh, win the case, uh, most likely on murder. So there was an agreement that he would be permitted to plead guilty to involuntary manslaughter and the sentencing would be left up to the judge. So the defense thought that was fair enough and the prosecution, well, that's not too bad for us either. So at time of sentencing, the question was, what should his sentence be? He's going to be sentenced to state prison. Uh, how much time would he get? Well, Marlon arrives there with his other stepson, and at the time of sentencing, he tells the judge, he gets up, and he starts to ramble. He doesn't make much sense what he's saying. Now, here is, you know, the number one actor in the United States, and he's not doing a very good job of acting in front of the uh, judge. He gets up there, and he blames uh, Christian's behavior on uh, his ex-wife, on uh, Christian's mother, Anna. And then he says, I led a wasted life by chasing a lot of women. Well, that was true. I think that perhaps I failed as a father. Well, there was a lot of truth in that too. So those are statements that he's making. And then the judge has to make a decision, okay, what should I do as far as sentencing? The DA's office had recommended 16 years in st uh, state prison. And Dag's uh, father, he got in there and said, well, I think he should get the maximum uh, sentence, which would be 25 to life. And the judge came out uh, with a 10-year state prison sentence. So that's what Christian got, and he had to go to state prison. 
And he went and he was sent up to the California Men's Colony in San Luis Obispo. Uh, it's not a uh, high level prison uh, because Christian was not considered a high risk. So he goes up there and that is where he's serving his time. And not every weekend, but maybe every other or every third weekend, it was always interesting that Marlon Brando with his limo would be driven up to San Luis Obispo and he would go in there and visit his son, Christian. Did that month after month after month for at least five years while he was there. Now, the mother of Christian was Anna Caspi. That was uh, Marlon's first wife. And she was an actress and she had uh, some kind of bit parts, but she did fair, but not a famous actress. So that's how Marlon got to know her. Uh, they had some movies that they uh, worked on and they started dating and when you start dating, uh, she became pregnant and then the decision, well, she's gonna have to get married for the sake of the studios and get married and it didn't work out didn't work out and later on she wrote this book Brandon Brando for breakfast not very flattering now her son was Christian Brando and she raised him she tried to raise him however Anna had some problems some depression problems and she started using drugs quite a bit on drugs and alcohol and this made it very difficult for her to raise a young son like Christian. So custody was taken away from her and it was Marlon's um, sister who started raising him. And eventually, oh, I think it was when he was about 14, when Christian was 14, Marlon got custody and he was trying to take care of him. But his idea of taking care of him was hiring nannies to look after him. And, he was sent to a boarding school up in uh, Ojai, California. So that was kind of the life of Christian. He didn't do well in school, uh, was not academically inclined, and he got involved in drugs. Drugs, the two things that were important in his life were drugs and guns. Uh, he lived with his dad for a while on Mulholland Drive that eventually his dad bought him a place on Wonderland Drive. So it was not a successful uh, relationship that he had in growing up. But then he, you know, is the son of a famous actor. So he got involved in doing some movies and he did a movie uh, and another movie was Peter Sellers I love you, Alice B. Copeless. And his performances were not exactly stellar. Uh, he did not have uh, the style, the uh, charisma that his father had. So his acting career kind of poof, disappeared. What was his main employment? Christian, you know, had difficulty with drugs, but when he was able to work, you know, he was generally a welder. By trade, he was a welder, and he was a fairly good welder. But out in the San Fernando Valley, he was well known as a tree trimmer. And he had a tree trimming business, and they were very good. They could do all sorts of trees that other um, tree trimmers wouldn't do. So those were his uh, occupations during this period of time. Now, what happened after he got out of prison? As I say, he served five years there. He was placed on parole. He went up to Kalama, uh, Washington State. And it's a very rural area, and he liked it up there. Uh, as a matter of fact, his mother, Anna, was living up there at the time. And he did it for a number of years. Uh, lived up there, got along with the people. He blended in really didn't stand out uh, but he would come back to Los Angeles and uh, in 1999 he 
would frequent Chadney's in uh, Burbank, and that was where the old stars, uh, actors and musicians would hang out, the, the guys, and they would be a lot of uh, women uh, who wanted to, you know, date a movie star, an old movie star, or, you know, marry an old movie star. That's where they would hang out and try to meet these guys. And that's where Christian met Bonnie Lee Bakley. You know, she wanted to marry a celebrity. She wanted to uh, somehow uh, be with the stars. And she dated all sorts of uh, men from Chadney's. So he met her there and he started dating her. And uh, eventually they had quite a re relationship. What was interesting about the relationship, both of them were on parole. She was on parole for fraud and he was on parole for, you know, involuntary manslaughter. So they did have some things in common. What was interesting, after a while, you know, uh, Bonnie Lee got pregnant and she had a baby and she named it Christian Shannon Brando. She really didn't know who the father was, so you know, since she was dating a uh, Christian, she used Christian's name on the birth certificate. However, it turned out when they did the DNA test, it was Robert uh, Blake who was the father, and Bonnie Lee Bakley uh, somehow got murdered, and uh, Robert Blake was prosecuted for it. He got off, but uh, she died from being shot in the car, in uh, Blake's car. What was interesting in that trial with Robert Blake, his attorney, the defense attorney, was trying to get Christian Brando to testify. He wanted him to testify to a statement he had made a long time ago about Bonnie Lee Bakley. He had said to a group of people uh, in front of Bonnie, you're lucky somebody ain't out there to put a bullet in your head. And the defense wanted that information in front of the jury. But the judge said, no, no, it can't come in. But when it came to the civil trial, they tried to get him to testify uh, to that statement. And he wouldn't do it. Christian would not testify against Bonnie Lee Bakley's family. And he took the fifth. So when he was called to the witness stand, he took the Fifth Amendment and would not uh, say a word. As a result of that, he was held in contempt of court. It's kind of interesting how the Robert Blake case, where he never served any time, Kristen Brando, who had nothing to do with uh, Bonnie's death, he had to pay a fine for contempt. He paid a thousand dollar fine. He's the only one that uh, uh, either was found guilty or found in contempt of court. So, Kristen wasn't always lucky. However, uh, Deborah Presley came along. She claimed to be the illegitimate uh, daughter of Elvis Presley. And they got married. They got married uh, and lived together for some time. Uh, however, didn't always work out. There was a lot of fighting. Uh, he was doing a lot of drinking and drugs. And she had him prosecuted and he pled guilty to uh, domestic violence. So that didn't work out. They got a divorce. Uh, now, as far as the end of Christian, it was not a happy ending at the end. Um, he had lost all his money. He didn't have anything. Uh, he was living with a gal, um, oh, I don't know, she was 20 years older than he was. And she had an apartment, a little dive of apartment behind the Seven Vales uh, a nudie bar. And that's where Kristen spent his time. He couldn't get a job. He couldn't hold a job. He was kind of in poor health. And eventually, he went to the hospital, the emergency room. And he says, I'm not feeling well. And as a matter of fact, he had passed out. And so they took a look at him. They started checking him out. Sure enough, he's, he wasn't well. And on January 26, 2009, 
he died. He died of pneumonia. He was only 49 years old. Just think of it, 49 years old. And what a shame, what a hard landing. It was kind of interesting at his funeral, this is what the minister said about uh, Christian. He had a hard life. He really did. That's true of a lot of people who are born into fame. There's so much truth in that, what he went through. And there is his tombstone up in uh, Washington State. Now, what happened to his mother, Anna? Well, she wrote a, another book, Brando's Bride, and as I saw, she was a glamorous movie star for a short period of time, and they had these custody battles uh, over Christian uh, for years, for years, and she tried at various times to uh, be a mother to Christian, but she had her own demons, her own problems. And eventually she had uh, Christian kidnapped and taken to uh, Mexico. And that was resolved by him being brought back and then uh, Marlon having the right to visit um, Christian. But she had an interesting life and it didn't end all that well for her. She became a housekeeper uh, down in San Diego. This was her trailer uh, mobile home park where she lived and she at the very end had a very unhappy hard life living by herself with her cat no money at all and she eventually died in uh, 2015 at the age of 80. Now Marlon's wives there were Quite a few wives. We just talked about Anna, um, and then he was married to Bobita Castaneda. That was a short one too, but the one that's the most famous is Tarita, uh, Tarapata, um, and we'll talk more about that. So all of his wives, he, this group, had this interesting look, exotic look, and something he liked. And, and what about his children? How many children did he have? Well, those from his wives, and he adopted a number. And he had a number of children through his um, housekeeper, Maria uh, Ruiz. So the total number of children that Marlon had was 11, 11 children. Quite a household. Now, he did Muti in the Bounty in 1962, and he was there down in Tahiti, and that was where he met Tarita. Tarita was selected to be his co-star, and they fell in love. They fell in love. Uh, he was down there uh, away from Hollywood. He liked the life down there in Tahiti, and they got along very well. They got married and lived together for a long period of time down in Tahiti and he would come back do a few movies and go back to Tahiti. And this is Cheyenne. Cheyenne was born and she grew up uh, in Tahiti there. Uh, so that was the life that he had and she had. Um, and Cheyenne was kind of the, the child that uh, Marlon was, you know, he felt she could do no wrong. They were very, very close, and she kind of got her way. When she wanted something, she was always very determined, and she could get Papa to give, a, give her whatever. Now, he was doing a movie, The Freshman, up in, uh, I think it was Toronto, Canada, and he never would allow uh, his children to come to wherever he was filming. and. She wanted to go there, and he said, no, you can't go. You cannot leave Tahiti, you stay down here. I'm going to go do the movie. She was so upset about that. She went out, she got in her Jeep, and she started driving erratically, you know, very, very fast, and it rolled over um, a cliff, 
down a hill and she was very severely injured, breaking her jaw uh, and really disfiguring her face. So that was tragic for her. And she could be very, very depressed about it. She even tried to commit suicide and was in a coma for a period of time. Now Marlon wanted to help his daughter out. So he's now living in a, you know, Los Angeles, um, uh, Mulholland Drive and he tells her come on up here you come up here and live with me and uh, has uh, her mother Rita come up and she does she comes up and as we said uh, she's there with her um, stepbrother Christian and there's the shooting of Dag and she goes back to it was very sad for five years after the shooting she was depressed and she lost the child she had, she gave birth to the child but she uh, lost custody she could not uh, stay off of drugs she was so depressed and then one day in uh, her mother's house she hanged herself she was only 25 years old what a shame, what a shame. She had so much to live for. And it was tragic for Marlon as far as Tarita. So I always wanted to find the grave um, in Papeda, uh, Tahiti. And every time I went there, I never could find where um, they were buried. And Eventually, on one of my trips to Tahiti, I had somebody in the cemetery there, one of the workers, show me, okay, where is Dag buried? Cheyenne is buried in the same crypt, in the same area. The Droulet family was so nice, so nice to allow Cheyenne to be buried next to their son, Dag. So, even though uh, he was buried there in 1990, and she committed suicide in 1995. Uh, they're both together in that one area in the cemetery. Now, Tarita, she's still in Tahiti. This is one of her houses. When I'm over there, you know, I drive by. Uh, that's her one house. Now, her other house uh, in Bora Bora is a little bit smaller, but she has a nice yard. And right across the street from that house, is where they live, where Tarita and uh, Marlon lived. That's where Cheyenne grew up, right there in that house in Bora Bora. Now, as I say, Cheyenne had that son, and his name is Tuki, and uh, he was raised uh, mainly by the Drolet family. Dag's family raised him, and he became a fashion model in um, uh, Paris and if you see advertisement for uh, one of the fashion houses he's one of the models that you'll see uh, so that's what he did now what about Brando's Tahiti he loved Tahiti he loved the people he loved the scenery everything about it is so nice it's pristine so Marlon would have loved, loved to have lived there forever if he could have. He bought this, um, it's an atoll, it's a group of islands all together, they're coral. Uh, Terra Toa is not too far from uh, Papeda. You have to take a boat out to it. And he bought that island and uh, I say atoll. There were no roads. He had built a compound there many years before. Uh, they had a little bit of a, a airstrip in there, very, very small. So that's what it was like, the property that he owned down there, that he always held. But eventually uh, he sold an interest or part of it. And uh, before his death, he was trying to figure out how to build a luxury hotel and 
he didn't have the know-how to do it, but he knew this fellow, Richard Bailey, who had a lot of money, had a lot of time, and he talked him into building um, what is called the Terrota Miranda Hotel, and it opened in 2014. And there it is on the atoll that where Brando used to live. What an interesting, beautiful hotel. Just not just five star, most likely six star, seven star. A fantastic hotel out there. Um, it has everything. It has everything. The finest of uh, food, uh, spas, pools, activities. It only costs uh, $4,800 per night. So you have to get your name in if you're going to get a reservation. So it lives forever, a beautiful, beautiful area in Tahiti. Now, as far as Brando's legend, is it going to live forever? He played so many parts. He was in so many movies. And it was unfortunate he died in 2004 at the age of 80. And all we have left is on the Walk of Fame, the Marlon Brando star. What an incredible life that Marlon Brando lived. Chris and Brando's life could be considered a celebrity curse like many other people of Hollywood uh, who were actors, musicians, and movie stars. I wrote a book called Celebrity Curse that you might find interesting. Anyway, hopefully you have enjoyed this episode on Kristen Brando, and you'll join us again for another True Crime Files of Los Angeles by Ronald E. Bowers. See you then.